Jason Barney here for Educational Renaissance. Today I want to talk with you about training in the arts versus teaching sciences. Training in the arts versus teaching sciences. I've previously written and spoken on the classical distinction between an art and a science, but I recently discovered some interesting confirmations of it in Plato and John Milton Gregory two otherwise widely divergent figures in the history of education. Now, in particular, the chief takeaway for teachers is a clearer awareness of when you as a teacher are focused on training students in an art versus teaching them a subject. So to summarize the classical distinction between an art and a science, Aristotle defined the intellectual virtue of art what I like to translate as artistry or craftsmanship as a, quote, state of capacity to make something involving a true course of reasoning. And that's from his Nicomachean Ethics of Book 6. Now, the painter makes paintings. The musician creates music. The architect designs buildings. And all of them do so with a reasoned awareness of the constraints of the world, and the proper steps necessary to bring what they imagine into being. On the other hand, the intellectual virtue of science, Greek episteme, or in common parlance, knowledge, is for Aristotle, quote, a state of capacity to demonstrate, also from the Nicomachean Ethics, Book 6, meaning that in order to know something in this scientific way, to scientifically know something, someone should be able to prove it or give evidence that it is the case. So experts give evidence in order to prove the truthfulness of certain claims, thereby endeavoring to establish genuine knowledge about their subject. Perhaps you could see at a glance why this, may, this incredibly important distinction um, is so crucial for educators. Training a child in an art should follow a markedly different process than teaching a child a science. Artistic mastery requires a great deal of coached practice in the art, while knowledge of particular truths in a subject entails research, gathering evidence, careful thought, and the weighing of arguments. Where this comes to a head most of all is in our application of the classical liberal arts in our schools, particularly the trivium arts of grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric, but also the quadrivium arts of arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. While we've continued to call them arts, it's my contention that we've been so caught up with modernist privileging of science over everything else that we've fallen into error in both our understanding of what these arts are in their essence, but also in our methods of teaching them, or sh I should say of training students in them. We've treated the liberal arts as if they are sciences, and our students have been the worse for it. Well, now in um, unpacking it and applying this crucial distinction, let's start first with John Milton Gregory's distinction of training versus teaching. So my first big point comes in unpacking training versus teaching in John Milton Gregory's The Seven Laws of Teaching. Now at the school um, where I work, we, we've gone through John Milton Gregory's Seven Laws of Teaching. I've gone through this several times with faculty here and elsewhere. Now in, in rereading it um, previously, I had come across this passage in his introduction that caught my eye because of its relationship to the classical distinction here between an art and a science. So John Milton Gregory, talking about teaching um, and education in general, he divides the whole art of education into what he calls two branches. The one is the art of training, the other the art of teaching. Training is the systematic development and cultivation of the powers of mind and body. Teaching is the systematic inculcation of knowledge. And that's from page 10 of the Canon Press version of John Milton Gregory's Seven Laws of Teaching. Now, here I saw again 
this classical distinction between an art and a science articulated in a different form. So where Aristotle's expression of it held the trappings of a work on personal ethics and therefore focused on the su subjective virtue of an individual, John Milton Gregory was expressing the distinction from the perspective of an educator. Education, he said, involves two core parts, training in the arts, i.e. any of the powers of mind and body that produce something in the world, and teaching of knowledge in a particular subject, science, the subject uh, in which things can be known. Now, John Milton Gregory goes on to explain the how and why of training in more detail. He says, as the child is immature in all its powers, it is the first business of education as an art to cultivate those powers by giving to each power regular exercise in its own proper sphere, till through exercise and growth they come to their full strength and skill. This, to me, expresses well my um, previous article's contention for the importance of lots of coached practice. Training students in an art requires giving them regular exercise and a long process for the development of what John Milton Gregory calls strength and skill. Now, I probably don't even need to add that recent research on the importance of deliberate practice or purposeful practice over the course of thousands of hours is confirming this traditional insight. Highly focused, repeated firing of the relevant neural networks is apparently the key to the formation of myelin sheaths around those neurons so that their firing can occur with high levels of efficiency and accuracy. And I would point you here, if you're interested in more on this elite performance research, specifically around deliberate practice, and um, neurons and myelin to the book, The Talent Code, or I would also recommend Talent is Overrated or Outliers or any of the other books that are drawing primarily from Anders Ericsson's research. He's in the last few years come out with a book of his own peak that is also just incredible. So check those out if you're interested in that course of study. Now, incidentally, John Milton Gregory also concedes that training is more primary or the, that it is, as he says, the first business of education, because without the training of a child's powers, they cannot even grapple with the stuff of knowledge. The arts, I would say, are a basic human form of culture making, to use Andy Crouch's term uh, from his book, without which knowledge isn't even possible. In contrast, though, um, John Milton Gregory would describe teaching as the communication of knowledge, dropping Aristotle's emphasis on the ability to demonstrate. Um, it's interesting that modernism and empiricism had by his time effectively undercut Aristotle's emphasis on deductive logic's ability to prove things from universals. The promise of presenting the results of modern science had sort of already come into its own and subtly influenced John Milton's Gregory's view of what it meant to teach knowledge. We just give them the results of modern science. We, we tell them what the knowledge is, communicate it to their minds, and then if they understand it, they know it. As opposed to in Aristotle, where a student actually has to be able to demonstrate for it. Someone needs to be able to demonstrate or prove for him or herself something to know it. If you just receive it, you know it. And that um, is different. I, as I'm developing this series on Aristotle's intellectual virtues, I would say that what John Milton Gregory is really getting at here is intuition, the ability to perceive things and understand things that are givens. That's different, and you need scientific knowledge as well to actually get to wisdom. But that aside, this is my explanation of the curious feature of John Milton Gregory's account, that he, he just thinks of knowledge as having received, you know, a communication of knowledge from a teacher or a book. Now, he's written his whole book, too, based on the laws of teaching. So John Milton Gregory's seven laws are the laws of teaching, not training, even though he concedes that training is the most important. So he leaves the art of training aside, instead focusing on the rules or laws of teaching. This uh, 
uh, in its in and of itself is a, is a curious feature that seems to resonate with the modernism of John Milton Gregory's era. Uh, and that's something that's important for us to note as we use uh, John Milton Gregory in our classical Christian schools is a very popular book to be used in training. I think we need to understand where it's coming from and maybe have some ways of uh, seeing the other side of the coin. If if one side of the coin is teaching, the other side of the coin, even in John Milton Gregory's points, is training. And we should make sure that we're, you know, looking at how we do training well as educators. Um, I would note that Milton, John Milton Gregory claims that these two aspects of education, training versus teaching, he says are, quote, though separable in thought, are not separable in practice. The fact that he emphasizes this so strongly, though understandable and no doubt correct, just goes to show how far the tradition has come since Plato and Aristotle. Right? In those days, the arts were viewed more concretely, almost as professions or trades rather than academic attainments. And so that, leaving um, John Milton Gregory aside, brings us to our next major point is to explore the arts as professions in Plato's Gorgias. So we're going back in time all the way to um, the ancient world and uh, the, the stories of Socrates in the dialogues of Plato. So since about the fall of 2018, um, I uh, used for a few years the Plato's Gorgias with my students uh, when I was the senior thesis advisor, and I love this dialogue. It's one that you should pick up if you're interested in rhetoric in particular, um, but these ideas around the liberal arts is, is, has so many important kind of implications in, in the wandering train of thought that Plato's dialogue of between Socrates and Gorgias goes down. Now, the dialogue is, is this sprightly example of Socrates' witty repartee with a prominent figure, Gorgias, who claims so much for himself. Gorgias was a famous rhetorician with a flowery style who traveled around Greece, taking payment from students to train them in his art, his art of rhetoric. And in the dialogue, Socrates forces Gorgias to adopt the shorter method of discourse, his own preferred dialectical method. So Socrates is practicing dialectic. Gorgias prefers to wax eloquent in rhetoric. But, um, you know, Socrates forces Gorgias for the sake of the argument to adopt this dialectical approach rather than his normal rhetorical speeches. And then Socrates systematically picks apart what the art of rhetoric really is and whether or not Gorgias can really train men in all that he claims to do. And what's interesting to note for our purposes is a further confirmation that even before Aristotle articulated that distinction between an art and knowledge or science, that distinction was alive and well in Greek educational culture. So, so for instance, Socrates begins by discussing numerous other arts or professions in order to illuminate what exactly Gorgias claims to be as a rhetorician. So throughout the dialogue, he brings up the art of a weaver, a physician, a trainer, a business owner, an arithmetician, and a geometer, among other professions. Of course, he also mentions that the art of dialectic that he himself engages in and discusses at length the nature of Gorgias' art of rhetoric. Now, when uh, Gorgias defines rhetoric as the art of discourse. Socrates makes the point that other arts deal with discourse as well. For instance, the physician discourses with the sick about the remedies for their condition, and the arithmetician about odd and even numbers. So in a way, Plato's Gorgias here foreshadows the later idea of the liberal arts, which would include arithmetic, geometry, dialectic, and rhetoric. They are distinguished from other arts by how they use discourse in words or numbers to create their product. Unlike the products of a weaver or a sculptor, a trainer, or a physician, their product itself is the words um, uh, that are numbers that are now present in the world because of the orators 
or um, geometers work or creating activity. Now, that product could for them be the ephemeral spoken address of an orator or the record of it uh, written down for later. It could be the mental calculations of an arithmetician or the recorded transactions in a business ledger. The dialogue is also interesting for how Socrates' chief critique of Gorgias' art of rhetoric turns on Gorgias' claim to being able to persuade anyone of anything regardless of his own lack of knowledge or expertise in that area. So for example, Gorgias claims that his brother, a physician, could not get a certain patient to take his medicine until he, Gorgias, came along and pleaded with him. Socrates seems to almost be objecting to the art of rhetoric's ability to persuade others of beliefs without, quote, inculcating knowledge or teaching them anything. For this reason, Socrates thinks the art of rhetoric is suspect because it can be used to convince people of false ideas just as well as true. In other words, Socrates thinks training students in the art of rhetoric without teaching them true knowledge in the sciences leaves the world ripe for manipulation. For Socrates, rhetoric is a manipulative technique like cookery, which doesn't make food nutritious, or cosmetics, which doesn't produce a real health and beauty. All this would certainly support John Milton Gregory's claim that training and teaching cannot or should not, in principle, be divorced in our practice, even if it's useful to us as educators to distinguish between them in principle. Well, this leads me to my third major point, is that there are, therefore, two errors in training versus teaching. So drawing from John Milton Gregory and now Plato's Gorgias, we can illuminate two errors that we might make as educators in training versus teaching. Um, now, while I'm inclined to think that our chief error today is aiming to teach students abstract knowledge and rules about the liberal arts, rather than affording them enough coach practice to develop proficiency, Plato's Gorgias provides a unique and powerful check on the other side. Um, neglecting the teaching of genuine knowledge can be just as deadly an error. We might conceive of these as classical education's Scylla and Charybdis. On the one side is the perilous rocks of focusing so much on knowledge acquisition and testing that students lose all active agency in their learning and come out of their rhetoric classes with a host of memorized figures of speech and rules, but no facility or confidence in speaking or writing. On the other side is the vortex of Charybdis, where the powerful currents of worldliness draw in students whose training has given the ability, them the ability to manipulate others, regardless of truth or goodness. Perhaps there are some debate programs or classical schools that so focus on mastery of rules and practice without the heart of knowledge that this is a live option worthy of fear. But again, my hunch is that most of our modern schools are so focused on the task of learning about rhetoric that our students are left without much practice in learning how to speak, to stick with one example. So I ask you as I close, how do you keep the balance of training versus teaching? Do you know when you're doing one rather than the other? Are you adopting the right methods for training as opposed to teaching? Are you keeping the balance? Though you might not be able to separate them fully in practice, you probably have one goal rather than another, and that could sharpen and hone what you do lesson by lesson, day after day, in your school or home classroom. Jason Barney here for Educational Renaissance. Hope you enjoyed training in the arts versus teaching sciences.